Você está ouvindo o podcast Estudar Direito Pelo Mundo. Neste podcast, você aprenderá com o Klaus como você pode alcançar o sonho de realizar seu mestrado em Direito fora do Brasil. Envie suas perguntas e depoimentos no Instagram, arroba Klaus Lau. Olá, todos. Obrigado por nos acompanhar em um outro podcast episódio. E hoje, eu vou entrevistar Jessica Richmond Dworkin. Uh, she, she's a, a person with a lot of experience in the LOM world, and I'm very much looking forward to uh, this presentation today. So, Jessica, thank you so much for joining us today. And I'd like to ask, would you please introduce uh, yourself to us? I know that you have an extensive work experience all over the U.S. with LOM programs, and we are all excited to learn more from you today. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to join your podcast. It's my honor um, to be able to speak with you and, and by extension with a whole bunch of people in Brazil. I'm thrilled to be able to do that. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Jessica Dworkin. I have been working with LLM students since 2005. Um, so I've been um, in a lot of different capacities and at a lot of different institutions. I started out as a career advisor for LLM students. So really working with LLMs, helping them find jobs and make use of their OPT opportunities. And then I became the Dean of um, LLM and graduate programs. And I've done that now at um, several institutions. So I ran the LLM programs, um, everything from marketing and recruiting to admissions, to teaching, to student support. And I've done that um, both at public and private institutions in different regions of the United States. Um, and I've been doing that for the last 12, 13 years. Um, and I'm actually um, just left my last LLM institution and I will be uh, joining the next institution next week as the Dean of Admission for JD programs and a faculty member um, at a big public institution here in the United States. So it's really my honor and my pleasure to join you and, and share as much as I can to make this process transparent for people. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for, for joining us. It's really um, a big honor to, to host you with all of that experience, really. Um, well, most of, most, most of the listeners here are Brazilian lawyers and law students who are looking into getting an LOM degree. And, and uh, first of all, to, to get started in this conversation, I, I'd like to ask if you have some um, main things that you'd advise uh, people who are considering getting an, an LOM in the U.S., do you have some uh, go-to things that you'd normally uh, tell people? So if you could share uh, some ideas with us, that would be very appreciated. Yeah, and uh, with apologies, I think my internet cut, cut out. So I came back at the second half of that question. I wanna make sure I'm answering what you're asking. Um, so you're interested in kind of advice or tips for applicants? Mm -hmm. That's right, that's right. Okay. Yeah, so I was just, I was just uh, mentioning that most of our listeners are Brazilian lawyers and law students yeah. who are looking into getting an LOM. And then if you'd have some uh, general piece of advices that you'd normally give them, uh, people who are looking into getting one. Yeah, I think um, probably the best kind of general advice that I would offer to anybody is to really think about what it is you want to get out of your LLM experience. Um, I think it's easy to just say, I'm going to go to the top ranked school, or I'm going to go to the school that gives me the biggest scholarship, or I'm going to go to the school that's located in whatever city um, seems really fascinating and exciting. And um, those are obviously all considerations that I know students take into account. Um, but I really think you want to not do what everybody else is doing just because that's what everybody else is doing. Really think about what your own goals are, what your career goals are, um, what your personal or family life might require in terms of where you are, and then find the right school for you. There are a lot of LLM programs out there um, and they all offer different kinds of advantages, whether it's an area of specialization, a geographic area you're located in, the financial support that makes it possible, um, or some combination of those things. But I think really thinking about your own personal goals as you start to think about where you want to study and spend um, that important year or more of your life is, is what I would recommend generally to folks. That's fantastic. That's some, that's a really good piece of advice for sure. Uh, and, and at this point, uh, I've, I've been doing this podcast for over a year now. It's pretty, pretty exciting to get to meet so many incredible people in this world. And uh, I believe that at this point, most of us, most of the listeners and people who have been following this uh, special project that we are somewhat familiar with, you know, LSAT, TOEFL, 
all the really technical aspects of the application process. But uh, yeah. we, we, we understand that the process is very, very set in a technical way to make sure it's clear and transparent and, and that's great. And it makes it, um, I guess, somewhat less subjective as well, right? But uh, we also see that there are some things that, that people can do that can add some value to their application. Uh, that are not necessarily, you know, just the grades or just sending the, the things in advance. But uh, I'd like to ask you, what would you say that are some of the things that, that you saw over the years that were also valuable, but were not necessarily part of the, the checklist? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think um, kind of a tough one to answer succinctly. Um, I, I think at least speaking from my own personal experience and the places where I've been the one charged with making decisions about whom to admit and unfortunately whom to deny admission to for LLM programs, I always tell students, you know, having great grades, having a high TOEFL or IELTS score, those things are obviously helpful, right? Schools look at those things and it would be um, dishonest to pretend that they don't matter because they do. Um, but I think there's lots of people that have great grades or great English scores, or, you know, there's always going to be someone better than any individual applicant in at least one aspect of the application, right? There's always someone out there who has some better objective thing. But the piece that I always look for in admissions, and I think several of my colleagues feel the same way, is we're really looking for whole people, right? So what it means is not just people that spend their entire lives in a library and have excellent grades, um, that's nice, but I'm really looking for people that are kind, that are going to contribute to a community, that have outside interests, that are well-rounded whole individuals. And I think in any way that you can bring your authentic entire self to the application process, that's of benefit to you. Um, so one of the examples I give is I remember, gosh, it's probably been 12 years ago, quite some time ago. Um, I still remember a personal statement uh, from a student that I had then. And the reason it stuck out is because it told me a lot about who he was as a person, what his hobbies were, what his interests were. So this um, student applied um, to do some research, some, some deep diving into the legality around international trade law. And in his personal statement, he explained that he was drawn to trade law because he actually loved um, rock climbing. And so his hobby was to climb mountains and go rock climbing. And he learned that when he needed equipment that he had to get, I don't know anything about rock climbing, but whatever the equipment is that you need to do this sport safely and effectively, that there were different charges for the equipment depending upon what country he bought them in. And then it all had to do with import and export taxes and the ability to have free trade or hindered trade um, in the global marketplace. And that got him really thinking about how those things impact everyday people um, in all kinds of aspects of their lives. And so because of that, he had sort of developed this interest in trade law and that's what he wanted to do with his career. Um, a, it told me, you know, obviously the obvious things about personal statements, right? Like he could express himself clearly in English and it was grammatically correct. And it sort of hit those kind of basic requirements, but it told me a lot about who he was, what he did in his free time. He seemed really interesting. Um, and the fact that I remember this personal statement 12 years later, and I have read hundreds, if not thousands of personal statements, right? I think really speaks to the strength uh, and the benefit of really presenting your whole self in those applications. So I always tell students like, share something about yourself. Tell us who you are, the people reading your I, I apologize. Oh. I seem to keep cutting off. I don't know where I was when I lost you or you lost me. No problem at all. So uh, you, you were just mentioning the how important it is just to to show yourself as a 
as a whole person and that the fact that you remember this personal statement so many years after really tells of, of the importance of it. Yeah, that's exactly it. And the, the only thing I was going to add is I think it's now also fairly commonplace in the LLM admissions process for there to be interviews as a part of the selection process, right? That's a, a trend um, that started probably in 2010, I think is when that started happening. So it's now pretty commonplace. And again, that's an opportunity, um, not necessarily just to show off your knowledge, your legal acumen, but to, to let the admissions officers get to know you as a person, to see what you're interested in, that you have a genuine interest, you know, be, be your authentic self. Um, I know as an applicant, that doesn't always feel like very helpful advice because it's so vague, um, but I think it really is key, you know, be be your whole self. Don't be afraid to tell us who you are and what you're interested in, because we want interesting people in our classrooms and in our program. Oh, that's, that's really, really some nice uh, piece of advice for sure. Uh, I uh, One of the, the privileges I have had uh, since I, I started this, the podcast and the, the project in generally, uh, was also to visit some law schools. And that has always been so interesting because uh, it, it's not that often that we as applicants will have the opportunity to actually visit law schools, especially in another country. And considering that the US is a continental country, so there's so many schools to visit and to see and so many possibilities. So I really, really appreciate those, um, the, that, that piece of advice of really uh, showing who you are because it's a, it, it must be a mutual match, right? As, the, as you see the school is right for you, the school also see you're right for them and kind of um, needs you to match well in that sense. Well, um, you did mention that we shouldn't go just to the school that gives us the most scholarship, right? That's a, even though it's a very important uh, thing for most of us in developing countries also, uh, it's, it's clearly not what um, will, will possibly bring us the most happiness or the most we want out of our LOM program, right? And with your long experience, I, I thought to ask you about scholarships, you know, um, mm -hmm. uh, for, for what we see uh, here in Brazil, and maybe that's not a right perspective, maybe you could correct me on that. But um, as far as we know, apparently, if, if you are going, for example, in a PhD program, um, you're, you're definitely almost entitled to get funding for, for that degree, right? But then when it comes to LOMs, it's a, it's a lot harder to, to get funding for an LOM and scholarships, etc. Um, as, as far as I know, there's not a whole lot of uh, full ride scholarships for OM programs. So uh, would you be able to share with us some pieces of advice on funding your degree, especially for people who are in developing countries? And uh, when you when you exchange our Brazilian real into dollar and you see that uh, the, the amount of money to pay an OM, for example, would be uh, enough, you know, I don't know. 20 years of a minimum wage or something like that. So uh, we, we'd love to hear from you on, on that side too. Yeah. Um, so first, I think finances have to be a consideration for students and um, not just from developing countries, like American students look at that too, right? So that's a universal. No one wants to pay more than they have to pay um, for a degree. And I think, you know, the more scholarships you can get, obviously it opens opportunities and options that might not have been available without those scholarships. So the first thing is, I don't think students should ever feel embarrassed or ashamed to ask about scholarships. There's no shame in that. Um, I went to law school with a scholarship. Most people I know look for scholarships, like that's how it works. So first of all, never be embarrassed or ashamed to ask a school or the representatives about scholarships. But in terms of how it works, I think um, if I can take a step back, it's actually really helpful to understand the business of running a law school. So sort of how does the economics of a law school work, because I think that will help inform your listeners as to what's what's likely to happen with scholarships and sort of where the markets are, right? Um, so first, you're correct that most PhD students are um, funded and generally fully funded, right, for PhD studies. But that's true in disciplines outside of the law. That's not true in law. Um, and the reason that that's the case is that in those kinds of programs, think of 
chemistry or biology or you know, Portuguese language, whatever it is that students might be coming to the US to study, the courses in those departments at many universities are taught by the doctoral students or they're doing research and they're receiving research grants. There's other ways that money come in. In law schools, we don't have that set up, right? So there aren't graduate students teaching courses. They're all taught by the fully qualified professors. Um, we don't have federal grants or research labs. We're not doing chemistry experiments in the back of the building, right? We hope. Um, so there isn't that mechanism to have other funding which can offset the costs of students, right? So law school funding really comes from just a few sources, right? Some schools are lucky enough to have large endowments, um, which are investments that alums or other friends of the institution have made, and then the, the profits from those investments can help fund universities. Um, right now, the, the markets generally in the US are having a pretty tough time. Um, so even schools with pretty big endowments are seeing reductions in what that money will be. Um, the other big place that money can come from is for public institutions. They get some of their money from the tax revenue of the states in which they're located. Um, those budgets are also increasingly under scrutiny and they're being cut. And elected representatives of individual states often restrict where those monies can go because they're paid for by taxpayers of the state. They often restrict those funds to have to go to citizens of the state or at least citizens of the country, right? So they might not be as available for international students, um, which isn't to say there are no scholarships at state schools. There are, um, but just know that it may not be as wide open, right? We as admissions officers are restricted in who we can give and how much we can give to different people. And then the third place that money comes from uh, is tuition, right? So the tuition of the students is the largest piece of this puzzle. And that has to pay for salaries and the lights to be on and the books in the libraries and all of the other resources that students need. And so in general, I think you see fewer scholarships in law schools than you see in other disciplines at universities, right? So that explains the difference between kind of PhD and law and how that works. So then the question is, well, where does an LLM program fit in to this puzzle of like how law schools get money. So law schools, as your listeners know, are um, accredited by the American Bar Association. So I think there's just over 200 accredited law schools. So first, you should only go to an accredited law school, right? Don't go to an unaccredited law school. That's a poor investment. But you go to accredited law schools, and then those schools get ranked by the US News and World Report. And every representative from every law school will tell you, we don't like rankings. We don't think they measure the value of the education. We don't think they're good indicators. They're created on lots of different um, elements and the exact formula is kept a secret, right? But at the same time, we know that students look at those rankings. And as much as we say we don't like them, we know that that's one of the big considerations that students look at, particularly international students who don't have the opportunity to visit our campuses in person or to get to meet us. That might be some of the only limited information that's available. And so we know that that's important. Those rankings don't rank uh, LLM programs. And the numbers in those metrics are based entirely on JD programs, right? What's the LSAT and the GPA? How many volumes per student? What's the expenditure law school makes per student? But it's based on JD students, right? LLM students are not a part of that ranking. So then the question is, why do law schools have LLM students? And I'm aware this is a really long answer to your question, right? But why do why do law schools have LLM students? Well, I think they have them for, for a variety of reasons, right? Um, from the most sort of aspirational, which is having LLM students creates diversity and enhances the conversation in our classrooms. LLM students come with different life experiences, different backgrounds, different working experience, and it benefits everybody in the classroom to have those perspectives shared in the conversations. I think that's really important. I think um, it's nice to have diversity. So aside from it just enhancing conversation and creating deeper learning, it's a virtue, I think, in the United States that's generally accepted as being a value 
value that we embrace, that we want to have this diversity um, for the sake of diversity, right? For the sake of having different ideas and, and sometimes conflicting opinions and uh, perspectives and as to how we solve, we learn from each other. So, um, you know, Brazil has had some recent reforms in its legal system. Um, American students might learn a lot from the experience of Brazilians who have been practicing through these reforms as you I don't know if you can hear me. We just lost you there for a second, but I'll just wait. You probably will be back soon. I don't know why my connection is so bad today. I'm really sorry. Hey, don't worry about it. We, we didn't lose you for too long though. So okay, it was, good. You, you were just explaining about, you know, uh, how, how in the classroom students can learn about the reforms in Brazil and the reforms in the US, for example. Yeah, and I think the other reason we have LLMs is um, for economics, right? So law schools have LLM programs because it does bring in additional revenue to the law schools, right? That's, that's important, it's a business. And it diversifies the portfolio from which we draw students. So um, we don't wanna have students only in one program because if there's a um, demographic shift or, or something happens, then and it jeopardizes the future of the law school. So having multiple programs that draw students for different reasons and goals from different parts of the world obviously has some financial benefits to law school. What does this mean for LLM students or prospective students, right? It means that law schools want to have LLM students, right? Um, increasingly, they want them more and more. Um, and that's because I think more and more see the value, but also, um, there's a coming demographic shift in the United States. So in the next several years, we're seeing fewer students um, go to college. That population, that age group is shrinking. So we will see fewer people entering college. And by definition, that will mean fewer people enter law school because we do that after university. And so the law schools have to find a way to make up that lost revenue. And you're seeing increasingly the schools at the very top of the rankings list, right? Some of them have quite large LLM programs. And so they are digging deeper and deeper into the LLM applicant pool to fill those seats. And that has a trickle down effect. So what it means is as an LLM applicant, you are highly sought after right now in a law school admissions space. So I think students applying today or, or next week or in the near future are going to be able to get accepted into better law schools, higher ranked law schools with larger scholarships than was the case five years ago or 10 years ago. Um, so I think that's great for LOM students because law schools want you and they're competing for you, right? Um, it's nice to be wanted, but it also means you're unlikely to get full ride scholarships, right? Because the law schools need to see that they're still getting some revenue from having you there, right? So you're likely to get good scholarships, but I don't think they'll be full scholarships. So that's, I think, just important to understand what's the, what's the background and how does this work? Another question that's related to this that I often hear from students or discussions about is, can you negotiate a scholarship? You know, if you get a scholarship, can you negotiate? And I think that varies by school. Some schools do allow students to negotiate, um, some do not. And so I think the only way to know is to ask and just do it really respectfully. You know, just say, hey, I really wanna come to this law school. Is there an opportunity to negotiate for the scholarship? And I think you need to be prepared to tell them, I need X amount. And if you're able to grant it to me, I will commit to this law school, I will come. What schools don't like is you take offer from school A to school B so that school B raises their scholarship and then you take the increased scholarship from school B to school C and you keep playing that game. Schools, schools and folks like me get really frustrated with that. We have a limited scholarship budget. We have to try to get the best students that we can and we have to be thoughtful about where we spend those resources. But I think if you say, hey, I really want to come. I just need a little bit more to make this happen, but if you can do this, I'm definitely coming, right? Schools are more likely to meet you where you are. The other thing I tell students is, if you're looking at a school that has a relatively low tuition rate and a low cost of living, 
you might get a smaller scholarship than you would get in a, a larger, more expensive city or a more expensive school. Look at the total cost of attendance, not just the scholarship amount in a vacuum. So um, I'm, I'm in Florida, um, our tuition is relatively low. So if a student comes to me and says, I'm gonna pick on NYU, it's a wonderful law school in New York City, right? Um, I really wanna come to your school in Florida, NYU is giving me $10,000 more than you are, can you match it, right? My response would be probably no, because even with that larger scholarship, you're going to spend much more money to go to the school in New York, right? And so you want to look at that total cost of attendance as you're figuring out what it will actually cost you to attend the school and not just what's the number in the scholarship. Although I know it feels good to get really big ones. I get it. Wow, that, that was fantastic. That was definitely uh, something that we never had this before. Law School Economics 101. <laughs> that was that was really good thank you so much for sharing that and that that made it so so much clearer uh j just the, just to understand the whole economics of it that's really yeah. fantastic and as a matter of fact when when i first started it uh in 2020 uh just as the pandemic was kicking in and etc uh there were a lot of schools that that did um share that they had fully funded uh fully funded scholarships, full ride scholarships for law students, international law students. And as time went by, as I continued in the, in, the, in the project here, I saw that lots of the schools pulled off those programs and they were like, we're, we no longer have that endowment. We no longer have that scholarship. We no longer have that possibility. So it's uh, really interesting that uh, all of that you said so far about it. Um, well, so something that also is taken into consideration for, for, I guess, pretty much all the international students is the OPT, of course, and, and even potential sponsors for work after the LOM. So in, in your experience, um, did you see many success stories? What would you say for those who are uh, thinking and, and putting this as a higher priority on why they want to get, a, why they want to get an LOM degree? Why they want to get a, a, an education in the U.S. Do you have any any notes for for people who are uh, considering that too? Yeah, I would say if if that's important um, for for anybody, then you want to be really focused, um, and I think you want to take advantage. And I I would say this for all students, but especially if you want to stay into an OPT, take advantage of every single opportunity that presents itself. Um, so the way that Americans get jobs is very different um, from the way that I think getting jobs works in Brazil. Uh, eh, we'll say somewhat different. Brazil has some similarities with the US, right? And so let me start with anybody going to a US law school will have a career services or career development office. And that's staffed with people, most of whom have law degrees, um, who are tasked with helping students navigate the job search process. It's free. It's part of what you pay for with your tuition. Um, it's services that you're entitled to use. And I think you should absolutely take advantage of them, right? So first do that. I know those kinds of offices don't exist in Brazilian law school. So that, that concept is different. Um, so you want to make sure that you are making use of that. Those folks will help you with your resume. Um, so we don't use CVs in the United States. We use resumes and they have very specific formats and it's different um, than how things look in Brazil. So they'll help you Americanize your, your resume to make sure it's ready. They'll teach you about cover letters. Um, I think most importantly, they'll teach you about networking. So most Americans find jobs through networking. And that concept of networking, I think in the vaguest sense is not very different than Brazilian networking, right? Um, but I think the way that we actually execute networking is quite different. So in the US, um, it's totally normal to call upon strangers um, and just say, hey, you know, I came across your profile, looked really interesting. Can we meet for coffee? And no one thinks that's strange, right? Everybody will say, sure, let's do it. Um, and so I think that's something that is really uncomfortable um, for a lot of international students. And it's something you, you have to get used to. So I always tell international students, you know, part of your job is to learn all that you can learn in the classroom, learn the substance of why you're here. The other part is to really fully embrace the culture so that you become not only duly educated, but bicultural. And to do that, you have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, and that's, uh, 
it'll be great in the end. I understand it doesn't feel great when you're in the middle of it, um, but it's really, really important. And so you have to learn how to network. You have to learn how to connect with people. Um, you know, I always tell folks, you know, my own students, you know, connect with me on LinkedIn because all of my students are connected with me on LinkedIn. And so if you connect with me, you then can see the rest of my network and you can reach out to anybody there and say, hey, Jessica said I should reach out to you. Do you mind if we chat? And because over the years, I've always consistently said that to students, anybody in my network knows they might receive that email. They're sending it today, but in two years, they might be receiving that email and they're expected to, to follow through, right? To, to meet with people and talk. And that's just how things work. Um, so I think to be successful in OPT, you have to network really successfully because that's where most jobs come from, right? So you've got to learn how to do that and to meet people and to talk to people. You've got to have good grades in your LLM program. It's important that you succeed academically, that you demonstrate that you have the ability in English to do professional level work because employers will want to know about that and they're gonna ask you about that. I think um, English skills are incredibly important. America, uh, or the United States, because of its geographic isolation from a lot of the world, most Americans speak English and some might speak Spanish. Uh, and occasionally you'll get some other languages in there, but not a huge portion of Americans speak Portuguese. I would say most Americans don't speak any language other than English. And so they, um, for their own sense of comfort, want to know that you speak English really, really well, that they can work with you professionally, um, that you're going to be competent to write things and to read things and to talk to clients, and you've got to have strong English skills. The other thing that's really helpful is if you have any work experience from Brazil, from where you're coming from, when you come to the U.S., I would first tell those contacts, and this is part of networking, right? Hey, I'm going to the United States. I'm going to do an LLM program or a JD program or whatever you're looking at. This is a school I'm going to. Can we stay in touch, right? Let them know where you're going. Some of them might have contacts in the United States. They'll make introductions for you. Um, they will pave the way. Your, your law firm, if you're at a law firm, might have um, institutional contacts in the United States, and that can be incredibly effective. You know, students that have work experience that have introductions from law firms or their firm has an office here in the US, that's the, the most surefire way to have an opportunity in the United States. Um, so all of those things are important. And then I think you have to not give up, right? You're gonna get a lot of no's before you get a yes. And so it's important to not get frustrated, to not give up, to maintain a positive attitude and to just keep working at it. It takes quite a bit of time um, and a willingness to face those rejections um, until you get the acceptance. And you only need one, you only need one person to say yes, right? Um, but it might come after 70 no's. And so a lot of students just don't wanna keep hearing no, so they give up. So keep at it, um, stay positive, network, meet as many people as you can. And then the other anecdote I tell people is you never know who you're gonna meet that might be important. Right. So you might meet somebody that's not a lawyer and I would still be professional and be open because maybe their brother is a lawyer or their neighbor is a lawyer or you just don't know who they'll know. I had a student um, when I started out, I was in Washington, D.C. as a career advisor. And one of my students was standing in line to pick up a prescription at the local pharmacy. And he started talking to this gentleman who was in front of him in line. And they had a really lovely conversation just about, you know, casual things. And it turned out the guy in front of him worked for the World Bank and was a lawyer and gave this student an internship, right? Um, now, that certainly doesn't happen all the time. But it can happen and you never know who you're talking to or who they're friends with and who they know. And so just never, um, never take an opportunity for granted, never ignore an opportunity and make sure you're always presenting your best self um, so that when those opportunities occur, you're in a position to be thought of highly and positively and you can take advantage of them. Wow, what a story. That's fantastic. Uh, yeah. th 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 wow, this World Bank story, it's really nice. <laughs> um, and, I and, wish yeah. it happened all the time. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, but uh, I mean, th that makes sense. That just tells you how, how much that's important. 
And yeah, thank you so much for all the all the different pieces of advice and all the stories you shared with us today. I'm sure they'll be of great value for whoever is considering uh, going into an LOM, uh, whether uh, in the next application cycle or in the in the future. But uh, those are those are very valuable. So thank you so much once again, Jessica, for uh, agreeing to meet with us in your week off, <laughs> and we hope to to stay in touch. So thanks again. Yeah, thank you so much to you. Muito obrigada. It was a pleasure to speak with you. And um, I hope everybody listening finds success in uh, whatever future they're hoping for. <laughs>